Hello and welcome to MMA News Real Talk. I'm your host, Bastian Vendel Martinez, writer and reporter for MMA News since 2012. And as usual, this is me breaking down the biggest stories in MMA and combat sports, uh, unscripted, unedited, and just giving my thoughts. So I feel like the biggest MMA journalism story this week in regards to like news relating to MMA journalism in itself has been the uh, sort of feud between Chael Sonnen and Luke Thomas. Uh, this was surprising to me. I mean, like when a fighter retires, it's very rarely that you'll find some kind of beef or something like that come out of it. And at the very least, you never find it between fighters and journalists. But, you know, it's a crazy time we live in. Uh, so basically, I've been following the story a little bit. I mentioned it in one of the earlier episodes this week. Now I feel like I've seen enough to actually give my own thoughts on it. So. Chael, you played yourself. I keep thinking of that meme, the, the meme with DJ Khaled, where he's like, congratulations, you played yourself. That's exactly what Chael did here. Uh, Chael was the McGregor of McGregor Mayweather. He made the most noise. He absolutely had the, the biggest and strongest following. His fans were completely on his side, but he walked in unprepared. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's just break it down a little bit. So in the first video, I feel like Ch Chael Sonnen took a lot of things out of context. I mean, Luke Thomas, he, did, he released a video where he was like, uh, uh, Chael Sonnen is a very, very good fighter who got close to a lot of championships, uh, but he, you know, he never really got to the, the super great status. And I guess a lot of it comes down to how do you define a great fighter? I mean, right? Because there alone you have the whole, we have the the thesis of did Luke Thomas, uh, you know, speak accurately or not. And I guess it's kind of hard to do. I mean, in my opinion, like a great fighter, not necessarily someone who has to have won a UFC championship. I mean, there's a ton of great fighters who, who never did that. But it, like if you were to list the, the 20 greatest fighters of all time, would Chael Sonnen be on that list? He probably wouldn't be on mine. Was he great for the sport of MMA? Absolutely. Did he take the sport to new heights in regards to promotion and showmanship? <laughs> Without doubt. Did he give us one of the most exciting fights in UFC middleweight history against Anderson Silva? Irrefutably. Um, is he one of the 20 or even 30 greatest MMA fighters of all time? Not sure. But either way, I mean, that doesn't make Chael less great as such. I mean, him as... I almost feel like Chael Sonnen the person is greater for MMA than Chael Sonnen the fighter. I mean, there's his role in amateur wrestling. There's his role as an analyst. Uh, there's, I mean, honestly, his YouTube channel where he breaks down fights and all that stuff is, is great. But... Yeah, either way, I don't feel like anything Luke Thomas said was mean-spirited or like went after Chael as a person. I mean, the things he brought up, I mean, most of the stuff he said about Chael was actually good stuff. You know, he was just questioning like, oh, was this, you know, one of the greatest fighters out there? Uh, now, I do feel like there were perhaps some things that were, that can be interpreted as uh, a little, I don't know, sharp, perhaps a little bit edged, uh, certain comments. Which is okay, I mean, I can understand Chael uh, getting a bit of a rise out of that, but Chael's response uh, seemed much more personal. It definitely felt like he took it personal. And in some ways I can understand that. A fighter retiring is, uh, it's an emotional time. And, you know, you're, you've, these people have focused their entire lives for, for you know, several years, has their lives have been solely focused on competition and combat sports. Now, all of a sudden, that comes to, that changes. They have to find a different way to, to pursue their dreams. And uh, Chael Sonnen, he famously told his father before he passed away that he was going to win a title, and he never did. And I actually thought, I was very surprised that Brett Okamoto of ESPN, one of the most respected journalists in the game, someone who I admire a lot, that he would actually ask Chael Sonnen after his knockout loss, what would you tell your late father? I felt like that was in poor taste. Um, I feel like that's maybe something you can talk about 
in a personal one-on-one -on -one interview uh, when you've been talking a little bit with a fighter and you kind of have an existing relationship with them I would never ever ask a question like that at a uh, at a press conference asking a fighter about his dead father and the promise he made to him after and then you know after a knockout loss no I would never do that I thought that was in poor taste so if anything Chael should have gone after Brett Okamoto but now he went after Luke Thomas uh, and a lot of the other stuff that Chael brings up, I mean, he brings up good points about himself. Uh, he definitely does a good job selling himself as a fighter, which is something he's always been great at. Uh, I mean, let's face it, the whole, uh, his famous call out of Anderson Silva, uh, it wasn't that great. Uh, I mean, basically all he said was, Anderson Silva, you absolutely suck. Uh, but it was just, you know, it was the gravitas that he said it with and it was the, the rest of the speech and it was just like, it was a different, um, it was, you know, just the way he, he conducted himself. So Chael definitely did a great job selling himself, but then came the counter from Luke Thomas uh, and Luke Thomas started it off by making a perfect point. Like, he could not have made the point any better. He was like, Chael Sonnen has my phone number. If he truly wanted to, he could call me and we could sort this out. Honestly, this whole beef could have been solved with one phone call. Which Chael elected not to do. He elected to, instead of calling Luke Thomas on some of his comments on the phone, he called him out in front of the whole world on the internet on his YouTube channel. That's gonna get a response. I would have done that. Someone calls you out with a, 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 a YouTube video so the whole world sees it. You don't just give that person a polite phone call. They've raised the stakes. You have to do that as well. And Luke Thomas came prepared. He had fact checked every single claim that Chael Sonnen made and refuted a lot of them. He refuted uh, the comments in regards to. Uh, uh, Chael not getting any any cred for his win over Paulo Filo, that was not true. Uh, there were many of her claims that he made that uh, weren't factually correct. And Luke Thomas, he seemed just as sort of flabbergasted as a lot of other people and that like, I wasn't even trying to insult you. Uh, why are you taking it this way? Like he, he, the whole time I felt like for the most part, Luke Thomas kept his cool. Uh, I could definitely tell that he was frustrated which is understandable. I mean, one of the you know, most uh, forward and outspoken MMA fighters in the world calls you out and, you know, uh, and insults you. I mean, I felt Chael insulted Luke Thomas. Uh, he you know, said that uh, Luke Thomas has a little show that 15 people watch, something like that. Uh, he said that Luke Thomas was green with envy. Let me just address this real quick, because this is something that I read in the comments. MMA fans, or at least Chael Sonnen's fans, seem to think that us, like in the MMA journalism and reporting business, somehow are jealous of Chael for his success on YouTube. Uh, no. Uh, do I wish I had some of the YouTube views he has? Yeah, absolutely. I totally wish I had those numbers. Uh, but good on good on him. I mean, it's it's the same way I regard anybody who does any kind of successful MMA reporting or journalism, it's like, okay, good on you. I'm not gonna use up my day being being jealous. I'd rather step up my own game so that I can get there. Uh, I don't know anyone who has any bad feelings about Chael Sonnen doing, having a successful YouTube channel and being a, a great analyst. Uh, nobody's got a problem with that as far as I know. So no, Luke Thomas is not green with NB. I just feel, yeah. And uh, then we have, I mean, it, it, this is funny. This is like uh, the, the second round in the Anderson Silva rematch when Chael Sonnen gets overzealous and goes for the world's most ill-advised spinning back fist in round two, misses it horribly, falls over next to the cage and gets TKO'd. That is what Chael Sonnen's response video was because First of all, it's called, does Luke Thomas owe me an apology? No, he doesn't. In fact, you probably owe Luke Thomas an apology for, if not for the previous video, then for this one, because Chael uploads a video and admits he didn't even watch Luke Thomas's response. 
he makes this video based on things that people in his surroundings have told him about Luke's video. Not a good look, man. Uh, and for everyone who, th who thinks that like us MMA reporters are jealous of Chael Sonnen, Ch Chael Sonnen couldn't do the most simple journalistic integrity move ever, which was to actually watch the video you're talking about. You don't see a lot of movie critics just write a review without having seen the film. Uh, you don't see a lot of journalists and reporters uh, make a story without actually knowing uh, about what, yeah, knowing what we're talking about. And we can, you can tell even by the comments, uh, in, by Chael's own, by his own fans who follow his YouTube channel religiously. Uh, <laughs> big Chael fan, but he is way off the mark and this one should actually listen to what, to what Luke for a start. I'm assuming he means to what Luke said. Uh, You didn't see Luke's response video, Boy Stop Playing. I thought Chael accused Luke of being jealous of his media success. Am I mistelling that? Yep, sorry Chael, you are. Damn Chael getting bashed by his own fans. Still love you Chael, but watch Luke's video. You got brain damage, bro. Luke was pretty respectful to you as to all fighters. I was on Chael's son side, and he is still the man, but I think Chael watched his whole response and got his ass handed to him and is pretending he never watched it. Yeah, I mean, if your own fans are turning on you, that, that says something. And I thought this video, I don't know why he did it. I don't know why Chael would do this. It's not a good look, especially if you're trying to make it seem like other people are jealous of your journalistic integrity. You kind of shot yourself in the foot there. So anyway, that was my thoughts on that little drama that's been going on this week. Uh, and I try to look at it as a outside view, but for the most part, I pretty much think that Luke Thomas was in the right here. Perhaps some comments were a bit, uh, perhaps some of his phrasing could have been a bit better to, to sound a little bit less accusing of Chael or something like that, or to sound a, a little bit nicer. But I mean, when you're talking about a fighter who proudly calls himself a bad guy you shouldn't necessarily have to you know run your run your uh, your words through a, a child filter to make sure there's no risk of anyone getting one percent offended anyway moving on we have a uh, a pretty i mean compared to last week's ufc event this is this is the good stuff this is uh this is what i'm talking about so i got a little bit of heat for saying that last week's bellator uh, event was uh, better than the UFC's. I feel it was, uh, but uh, that, yeah, not to say that all Bellator cards are better than UFC cards. Just last week's. That's how simple it is. Some people do like Chael Sonnen. I don't actually watch what I say before commenting. So we've got uh, UFC on ESPN3, UFC Minneapolis, and it is a good one. It is. A, we got a, a heavyweight main event between Francis Ngannou and Junior Dos Santos. Number two versus number three, respectively, and there is a lot of, there are a lot of title implications around this fight, and rightfully so. I mean, they're the most highly ranked guys in the division after Stipe Miocic, who is the next one to challenge for the title. So it's only logical that the winner of this fight will, you know, go on to challenge the winner between Stipe Miocic and Daniel Cormier. So before I get to uh, the rest of the card, uh, let's just sort of break down the main event because. There's been a lot of talk from Junior Dos Santos uh, he, about this fight. I know he, he's challenged boxing champion Deontay Wilde, or hasn't challenged, but he said he wants to challenge him. And he's shooting for the title, and I do think he will be getting a uh, another shot of a title, actually, after his fight, because I do see him winning over Francis Ngannou. Uh, the first round is going to be very important, very telling of a fight. And if Francis Ngannou does win, the first round is definitely where he does it. That's 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 my opinion. But let's break it down a little bit here and get to why uh, why I think uh, Dos Santos comes out on top here. So everybody knows Francis Ngannou. He is a killer with dynamite in his fists. 
Uh, a lot of his finishes are in the first or second round. Uh, if we take a look look at just his uh, his UFC run, because those are the fighters that I personally am most uh, uh, know most about. Uh, so his first two fights, and then second round, and then Dr. Stop between second and third, and then we have a string of four straight first round uh, knockouts. He's coming off of two first round knockouts now as well. So he's definitely an early finisher by choice. Uh, there are certain fights where he has to sort of, like his UFC debut against Luis Henrique, I mean, a little bit of octagon jitters, I don't think any of us see Luis Henrique as an elite uh, heavyweight or light heavyweight fighter as such, but it was more of a sort of Francis Ngannou coming into his own and, and establishing, establishing himself in the UFC. Curtis Blades. Uh, different type of fighter now who we've seen him uh, find tons of success now since that fight and or well, not discounting the rematch where he got knocked out again but but uh, Curtis Blades strong wrestling base uh, not the flashiest fighter as such but definitely one who can give you problems and make you think and second guess some of your attacks but since then pretty much when he's been put up against uh, someone with a mostly striking base he has finished early now, he has two losses in the UFC, Stipe Miocic and Derek Lewis. Uh, the fight against Miocic was uh, one of the worst beatings that uh, we've seen in a long time in a UFC heavyweight fight. And uh, the fight with Derek Lewis was one of the worst beatings that us viewers took in a long time. Because that fight sucked. It was three rounds of aggressive staring. Uh, it was like ultimate staring championships. It was, uh, and at least these two fighters will be the first to tell it. I mean, Derek Lewis actually joked about it afterwards about how that was like one of his worst fights ever. So, so that's that fight's a little bit hard to take into analysis here. But one thing that I do see from uh, uh, from Junior dos Santos, uh, which I do think will be the, the key to victory here, is variety. Uh, I mean, he's. He never uses it, uh, and it's been questioned by Francis Ngannou, but he does have a BJJ black belt, uh, and he is capable. I mean, I don't think he actually has any submission victory. Yeah, he does have one submission victory, but I'm pretty sure that's before his UFC career. Yeah, it's just, that was his second fight ever um, against someone I've never heard of. But if we look at the difference in some of the statistics here, uh, and statistics is a good place to start, uh, not necessarily to finish. So, Junior Dos Santos, his four out of his five first wins in the UFC actually were in the first round. But we see him sort of start to, once the, the level of competition ramps up a little bit, we see him sort of start to take his time and, and just be more patient with his movement and with his attacks. Uh, the fight to Sh with Shane Carwin comes to mind. I mean, for those you know young young MMA fans watching this, they're probably thinking Shane who. But <laughs> way back when, uh, Shane Carwin, he was uh, he was like the next big thing in heavyweight. Uh, he was knocking everybody out. He knocked out Frank Mir. Uh, then he was really close to winning the UFC title against Brock Lesnar. Very close to winning in that first round but uh, ended up uh, gassing himself out and uh, then submitted him a second. Uh, Dos Santos had a very smart, very workman-like performance against Shane Carwin, where he truly dominated. I mean, he, he not that he made it look easy, but it, I mean, it, it was just like, despite everybody thinking that Carwin is this big, scary striker or you know, just knocking everybody out, Dos Santos used just like tactics and technique and combinations to t slowly wear Carwin down and just pick him apart with hard shots. I mean, we're not talking like a sort of like 100 Diaz strikes of picking apart, but more of, you know, obviously more spread out heavyweight strikes. Uh, if we take a look at uh, some of the other fights here, uh, we got Decision versus uh, Roy Nelson. We've got, uh, and like Mark Hunt. Mark Hunt's also a fantastic power puncher. Very is as he, Junior Dos Santos taking his time, not getting too reckless. I do recall him getting clipped by a hard shot there, but he recovered. Uh, the first fight with Stipe Miocic is also a similar fight where he can kind of like use combinations in a sense that you don't always necessarily see from heavyweight fighters, certainly not from Francis Ngannou. Francis Ngannou will throw fewer but harder strikes, uh, pretty much exclusively punches. 
whereas Dos Santos will throw more strikes uh, in wider variety, uh, throw in a couple kicks every now and then. I mean, we all saw his knockout win over Mark Hunt. And then uh, once he does get to the ground, we saw that against Tai Tuivasa. Um, he, he can definitely give uh, Ngannou problems on the ground. Uh, I think everyone's pretty well aware of the fact that Francis Ngannou does have, uh, I mean, if you're going to find one hole in his game, it's his ground game. So the way I see it, the moment this goes past the first round, uh, Dos Santos' chances of winning this fight have at least doubled. Uh, because everybody knows that, I mean, with a build and a body type that Ngannou has, it is going to be hard for him to go the full five rounds and be completely comfortable. I mean, he definitely wants to finish early. But the way I see it, the variety, experience, uh, combinations, and the style of attack, uh, more of a measured tactical boxer approach, uh, you know, in and out, in and out uh, from Dos Santos, as opposed to Ngano's uh, power heavy, uh, you know, more singular strikes. Uh, I see Dos Santos not trying to get in exchanges like the way that. Uh, uh, Alistair Overeem did and then got promptly knocked out. Uh, Dos Santos, his key to victory here, in and out, keep stay light on my feet, not stay inside the clinch for too long, but you know, get slowly get away these shots, throw in a couple leg kicks, things like that, just to make Ngano think, a little bit of clinch perhaps against the cage, uh, some dirty boxing, some cage work, just to slowly wear down Ngano, who will undoubtedly get tired after the first round. And uh, from there, I just see uh, Dos Santos picking up the pace simultaneously while Ngannou slows down. And uh, I think we will see a third or fourth round finish from, uh, from Dos Santos. So moving on to the rest of the card. I mean, that's obviously the, the, the big, by far biggest fight. But there are some other very interesting fights there. We've got a, a flyweight rematch between Josier Formiga and Joseph Benavides. Uh, Benavides won the first fight by knockout. Now, I, I mean, I definitely feel like Formiga has gotten better from that fight, but I, I can't see him beating Benavides, actually. I think Benavides, he's got such a good wrestling base, which a lot of the Team Alpha Male guys have. Uh, and he, I just feel like he has Formiga's number. He's not going to make the same mistakes that uh, Davison Figueiredo did against Formiga. Uh, you know, getting overzealous, getting taken down. Uh, I think Benavides, he's going to be able to keep it on the feet for the most part. And uh, on the feet, he's just got too much of an advantage. And I do actually think that he might be awarded a title shot if he wins impressively. Anthony Rocco Martin. Talk about a guy who made a career change. When he was just Tony Martin, nobody really knew who he was. But then something changed and he went from Tony Martin to Anthony Rocco Martin. And somehow the results have been fantastic since that. I don't remember exactly when he did it, but I think the move to welterweight is pretty telling when he went from lightweight to welterweight. Because there he is undefeated right now in the UFC. Uh, he's actually won uh, seven out of his eight last fights, with a loss coming to a split decision to Olivier Aldin Uh But he's got four straight wins now, including a fantastic knockout over Ryan LaFleur, uh, a slick submission finish over Jake Matthews, and he's recently coming off of a win over Sergio Moraes. Uh, that was a good warm-up, uh, definitely uh, beating Sergio Moraes by decision is, is a good warm-up fight for Damian Maya, who is best grappler in the division? Yeah, I mean, one of the best grapplers in the history of the UFC? Yeah, actually, probably, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Damian Maya, ma the submission magician, this is a tall order for Martin. Uh, this, this will be his big coming out party. I mean, if it, it's on the main card, it's against a two, former two-time title challenger in two different divisions. Damian Maya is a staple of the welterweight division. Uh, well, now he used to be in, in middleweight, but he's a staple of the welterweight division now. And he has been a little bit of a stepping stone for some fighters uh, to sort of break out into the top five. Uh, the fights with Colby Covington and Kamaru Usman come to mind. Uh, where he was kind of used as this like, yeah, like kind of like a gatekeeper to see if these guys could break through. Uh, I am leaning mostly towards Maya in this fight, but I have this weird feeling that uh, 
Anthony Rocco Martin might pull off an upset, but it's 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 just this kind of weird feeling where it's like I might put a little a little bet on it just in case, but uh, just looking at their styles, I just think Damian Maya will be a little too smothering. Uh, I mean, like a lot of people thought that Lyman Good was gonna be. Uh, uh, a guy who would be able to prove himself against Damian Maya. Damian Maya submitted him in the first round. Uh, now I do think that uh, Rocco Martin makes it out of a fight without being finished. I actually think this fight will go to a decision regardless of who wins. But I do think that Maya's style will be a little too tough for him. Uh, Roosevelt Roberts uh, looked great on uh, Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. Faces Vince Pichel. Solid, you know, like... Solid worker, <laughs> Vince Pichel. That's, that, like, work is what comes to mind when I think of Vince Pichel. He's not the most technical, uh, he's not the most flashy, but he does put on a lot of fun fights, and he's actually won uh, four out of his last five, uh, with the one loss coming to undefeated Gregor Gillespie, who, uh, you know, a fight where, like, nobody thought Vince Pichel was going to win that fight anyway, so... Uh, that should be fun. I see Roosevelt Roberts walking away from that. Uh, we've got Drew Dober versus Marco Polo Reyes. I think Drew Dober is a little bit cleaner, a little bit more technical. Uh, I believe he's a former Golden Gloves uh, fighter. And uh, yeah, I just think that Marco Polo Reyes, for as exciting as he is, and for me having trying to have a little bit of Mexican solidarity, uh, I just think he's a little too sloppy. He leaves himself open a little bit. And should this go to the ground, I think that Drew Dober has a stronger base. Uh, Light heavyweights, Alonzo Minifield and Paul Craig collide. Uh, Paul Craig, I feel like I keep counting him out <laughs> amongst others. Uh, a lot of people do count him out, uh, and I'm definitely one of them. Uh, but he manages to, to sort of pull pull it off. Uh, he had that fantastic win against Magomed Ankalaev, who was winning the fight up until the very last seconds of the last round, and Paul Craig in front of the uh, British crowd in London, managed to uh, to submit Magomed Ankalaev with a triangle. Uh, recently, he faced uh, four, uh, previously undefeated Kennedy. Oh, that's a tough name. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working, like I feel like I'm starting to get the Dagestani names down, but now it's like with all these Nigerian fighters coming in, I, I gotta like learn new tactics. Kennedy Nezuchukwu. Uh, I thought Kennedy was going to win that fight. I thought he, uh, he was going to use Craig as a stepping stone into the upper echelon, but uh, no, actually, despite some strong moments, Paul Craig showed his experience, he showed his grappling base, and uh, yeah, he showed that uh, you need more than just power in your hands to, to get past him. Uh, he also did pretty well against Jimmy Crute despite losing that fight. Uh, for the most part, I feel uh, he, he fought a good fight there. I do think though that, and now I'm saying this, I've, I've picked against Paul Craig in his last three fights and he's won two of them. But <laughs> I'm going to do it again here. I just think Alonzo Manyfield, uh, he is a guy to keep an eye on. I, I think this guy is a stud. He's a future star. He, he also came out of Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think this is going to be his uh, sort of his big moment as of uh, the first fight on the main card. Uh, we had some uh, some sad news as well that uh, less than 48 hours before the event here, uh, Team Alpha Males Vince Murdoch has to pull out of a fight uh, with uh, with Jordan Griffin. Uh, we still don't know complete details. Details are a little bit sketchy, but uh, basically what he said on Instagram was that uh, there were more tests required to be medically cleared, and for some reason he was not. Um, the way he, he phrases it, it seems like he hasn't had time to do the required tests. Uh, which is why he hasn't been medically cleared, but as of now, UFC have not officially released a statement as such. Uh, and I, I, with less than 48 hours, I don't think we're going to find a fighter to get medically cleared in such a short amount of time. Uh, then on the undercard, there, there are a couple fun fights. Uh, I mean, if you if you have the time, I would definitely actually recommend to watch it. The first fight is uh, Morris Green, uh, the Crochet King against Junior Albini. Uh, I feel like Junior Albini is one of those guys who the UFC kind of 
don't necessarily want to keep around that long, <laughs> if I can be as diplomatic as possible. Uh, he, uh, like, he, he had a great debut in the UFC. He uh, TKO'd Timothy Johnson in the first round, but since then, he's just had pretty lackluster performances. Uh, he did not look good against Andrei Arlovsky. Uh, he got submitted pretty handily by uh, Alexei Olenek. And in his most recent outing, he was uh, uh, knocked out by uh, Yarezinho Rosenstreich. So he's coming off of three straight losses, and now we're putting him up against uh, Maurice Green, who's actually coming off two straight wins. And to me, that kind of says that the UFC perhaps want to build up Green a little bit, and we're looking to perhaps uh, show uh, Junior Albini the door. Uh, Emily Whitmire fight is fighting Amanda uh, Rebus. Uh, Whitmire, a fighter who uh, uh, definitely a talent to keep an eye on. Uh, she's 28 years old. Uh, she hasn't had a lot of fights, admittedly. She's only had six fights, pro fights in her career right now. And she did lose her uh, her UFC debut to Jillian Robertson. But Jillian Robertson has proved herself to actually be a really solid grappler. And she uh, a loss to her in, her in your debut isn't really something terrible. Uh, but uh, Emily Whitmire is coming off of two straight wins, most recently over uh, the very popular Russian fighter Alexandra Albu. Uh, and I think that could be a fun fight. Uh, Jared Gordon against Dan Moret. Uh, Eric Yeboy Anders. Uh, hard to like someone, or hard to not like someone who has that nickname, Yeboy. Uh, he's had some tough fights, man. He. I gotta say, I like his style, I like his attitude, uh, it's just that, you know, he, he's had a tough run, he's had a real tough run, you know, he he came into the UFC from the LFA as the, as the LFA middleweight champion, he was undefeated, I think he had finished most of his fights in the first round, and uh, he looked great in his first two fights in the UFC, then he lost a split decision to Lyoto Machida, uh, in a close fight, I, I would need to rewatch that to really say if I completely agree with the decision. I just remember feeling like it was a pretty close fight and that I was pretty sure that the judges were most likely going to favor Machida. Uh, then he came back with a, a brutal head, head kick victory over Tim Williams, but Tim Williams had his moments in that fight. Uh, Eric Anders was in a couple tough situations in that fight, and sure, in the third round, he did manage to come, uh, come out with a victory, but it was not an easy one. Uh, a lot of people forget that. They just see the, the brutal knockout finish and forget the fact that Williams was actually doing really well. Uh, then he, he lost, he's lost three straight fights since then. He got TKO'd by uh, Thiago Santos. Then he lost a split decision to Elias Fiodoro, who's now been cut, so a loss to a guy who was recently cut is not a good look. And he most recently got completely picked apart by Khalil Roundtree Jr. Uh, so this is kind of a must-win fight for Eric Anders. Uh, I mean, it's very rare that the UFC will keep somebody around after four straight losses and losses in five out of your last six. Uh, possible, depending on if your name is BJ Penn or not, but uh, I don't see the UFC keeping Anders around if he loses this fight. So he's facing uh, Vinicius Moreira, uh, who is coming off of a loss to Alonzo Manifield, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, he's also someone who uh, came off of the Contender Series, and uh, I see this being relatively close, but... Uh, I mean, provided that Anders can let the fans get enough entertainment but without getting reckless, uh, I do think that he can pull this off. And then the uh, featured prelim is Ricardo Ramos versus uh, Journey Newsom. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I mean, Ricardo Ramos uh, had a very fantastic knockout uh, over Ayman, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ayman Zahabi, spinning back elbow. He is ever coming off of a loss to Said Nurmagomedov, so uh, I, I still think Ramos is going to take this fight. Well. But so, yeah, it is uh, David Wayne's fighters have not weighed in yet, but they will tonight. Results will of course be up on MMAnet.com and .se for those of you watching in Sweden. And those were yeah the biggest stories surrounding 
tomorrow's fight card and my thoughts on the Chael Son and Luke Thomas beef. Uh, let me know who you think is going to win the main event tomorrow night, Francis Ngano or Junior Dos Santos. I can also uh, say that uh, our sponsor, Ombet, actually has a fantastic boost of uh, five times the money if you do think that Ngano is going to win. You can bet five dollars, you get twenty-five dollar win. Uh, so go and talk, go on to MMAnet.com to get uh, to take part of that offer. And uh, yeah, so those are my thoughts on uh, the event. Let me know what yours are in the comments below. It's a lot of fun to read, uh, some, some, most of them. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm your host, Sebastian Mano Martinez. I'll catch you guys in the next video.